I want to begin by saying that trade is good and it has been extremely important in the success of the Irish economy as well as investment, which of course has underpinned much of the success, especially in weathering the storms of recent recession. And I think the role of any trade agreement, or indeed TTIP, which is much wider than a trade agreement in the normal sense of the term, because it includes issues to do with non-trade barriers, but also complex rules and provisions in relation to investment and protection of investors, that in that context, we need to be quite careful about the nature of what we're talking about, the evidence and the uh, various risks and benefits uh, associated with different aspects of this. And I think perhaps a, a little bit more uh, dispassion is necessary here because there are strong arguments being made for TTIP by the European Commission, by member state governments uh, in our own um, country, the uh, various government departments, are extremely enthusiastic about this, and I think it's necessary to have a more uh, informed, a more inclusive debate, uh, not only in our own parliament, but in wider civil society. And I just want to make the point uh, for information purposes, because the Nevin Economic Research Institute is funded by the trade unions. Uh, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, which represents uh, ultimately uh, 800,000 workers in, on the island of Ireland uh, voted unanimously against TTIP uh, at its July conference uh, earlier this year. Uh, furthermore, the European Trade Union Confederation, which is an umbrella of European Trade Union Federations, uh, has been very negative about TTIP, uh, although there have been some uh, diff divergence of views across European trade unions, but overwhelmingly the view is quite negative. And lest it be thought that this is uh, somehow a crude anti-globalization or anti-American agenda, the American AFL-CIO has also been very negative in relation to TTIP. So I think these are important facts that need to be taken into consideration and that we need to be able to address what are these concerns and why are people uh, actually uh, opposed in this case. It's not as if uh, those bodies that I have mentioned are inherently anti-trade or anti-EU, far from it. But there is something about the nature and scope of TTIP, the manner in which it has been conducted, but also the range of issues covered in TTIP that is giving rise to concern. I just want to get straight to the key issue here, which I think is the ISDS, the Investor State Dispute um, Scheme. And in a sense, this is a new term in Ireland. I suspect if you went down the street and asked people, you know, what did they think about ISDS, they'd look at you. Um, we don't have an ISDS in Ireland, and arguably we don't need an ISDS because investment has worked very well in Ireland. Uh, some might suggest that the Irish courts and the way in which the right to private property ha has been interpreted in the Irish Constitution means that there would be no concerns about uh, investor rights that it's already, in fact, well provided for in Irish law. But of course, TTIP is about a negotiation between the EU as a whole and the United States. And there have been quite a number of examples of ISDS in practice. Um, I'm going to mention one specific case involving uh, the uh, Romania and an ISDS um, uh, agreement with Sweden some years prior to Romanian accession to the European Union. Now, it's a complex case, it's ongoing, but the essence of it was a challenge on the part of the European Commission to the, Euro to the Romanian government uh, to stop uh, uh, giving state aid, which was actually uh, arguably part of the original ISDS arrangement with Sweden. And we have this very unusual situation where Romania is stuck between two positions, one relating to um, a, a, a case of state aid, which of course is not allowed under European law, and on the other hand, an ISDS agreement that predated uh, Romanian accession to the, um, to the EU. And I just mention that because we are dealing with very complex issues. Um, I'm not convinced um, that ISDS would not be open to legal constitutional challenge in Germany or in Ireland. Uh, no one can be certain about these matters it seems to me. Moving on from there, there are of course other concerns. Uh, it's not just about ISDS, there are other areas of concern in relation to public services. And the concern there is that uh, in relation to those areas of public service that are 
part of the commercial economy that, uh, where charges apply or where there may be competition involving public and private entities, uh, that uh, an instrument such as TTIP with ISDS could actually uh, uh, undermine the principle of public service provision. I'm not talking here about public administration or general government administration, but areas of uh, general economic interest and commercial activity. There's been a very animated debate in the UK about this, an exchange of correspondence between the relevant Secretary of State and the European Commission with uh, all sorts of guarantees and assurances, but this certainly has not assured many civil society groups and indeed people across the political spectrum. Which brings me to a brief comment in relation to what has been discussed in the European Parliament over the last few months. There has been a very interesting debate there, uh, a postponement of a vote in April, and then a vote on a resolution in July of this year. Now, just to remind ourselves that the European Parliament uh, doesn't uh, involve itself in the details of the TTIP uh, negotiations. It does, however, have a, a say in terms of uh, going with it, uh, adopting it or not. But the resolution in July uh, contained many interesting uh, compromise provisions, some of which emphasised the inclusion of labour rights, uh, ILO labour conventions, uh, in any TTIP agreement. Now, whether that actually would happen in practice and how that would be uh, interpreted is another matter. The key thing, however, is ISDS remains in the package. Uh, and that actually uh, was a key concern that led to a, a significant number of European uh, members of Parliament voting against that resolution in July. So the debate is very much live, it's ongoing, it's particularly uh, intense in countries such as Germany uh, and the United Kingdom, perhaps less so here, and it is something in which we need to be quite vigilant. One final area that I'd like to address is the economics of TTIP and the impact of TTIP on the economy and jobs, because there have been suggestions that this would be a game changer, that it would be really uh, important in terms of pulling Europe out of recession or stagnation, rather. Again, I think we need to be quite careful here, because looking at the evidence, for example, in the Copenhagen study of the impact of TTIP here in Ireland, and I've gone through that study and uh, looked at different sectors that were covered in, in that particular study. It's first of all evident to me that the use of the computational general equilibrium model, you might say, what? <laughs> That's a model that assumes full employment and uh, perfect elasticity in the supply of labor. I won't, I won't bore you with further details. But the technical assumptions made in any economic model are quite crucial to the outcome. The thing that surprised me about the Copenhagen study, actually, is that the estimated probable impact in net terms on, on, on Irish employment is actually quite modest. It's, it's somewhere in the region of five to 10,000 net additional jobs. Now, place that on one side, and on the other hand, a very different model that would be preferred by UNCTAD, and if you take the work of Jeronim Capaldo uh, with other colleagues in Tuft University in the US, they used a different model, a different set of technical assumptions, and concluded that for Europe as a whole, the net job impact would be negative rather than positive. Now, no one could be certain about these outcomes. There would, certainly will be winners and losers sector by sector, but I'm merely trying to draw attention to the fact that there is uncertainty and also the scale of positive impact both on GDP and employment is actually modest in one sense compared to a much wider problem of how to increase investment, raise skill levels, and restructure and rebalance the European economy. It's not clear to me that TTIP is actually the main or necessary or unavoidable driver that is going to deliver this change that we need. What therefore, in conclusion, is uh, the, the best way to approach this? Because it's easy to be critical. What is the positive uh, way forward here for, for member states and the European Commission? I would suggest a much slower process. I would suggest moving away from an omnibus approach, which carries many risks uh, and certainly does not have the support and buy-in of all civil society. And if necessary, that means subordinating trade and investment agreements to a much wider range of environmental, labour and citizen interests, which means that in the long run, actually, we're operating on surer ground. Thank you.